Hello and welcome to MacGyver's Grant Public Library's Chapter Book Storytime. We are continuing our journey with Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. This book was written by Rick Riordan. He wrote the words, so he's the author, and it was illustrated by John Rocco. And we are using this beautifully illustrated version, isn't that? The pictures are just wonderful, aren't they? We are about halfway through our book, and Percy and his friends are on a quest. They're going from New York to California, and they just fought Medusa. They fell asleep in a field. In my dreams, I stood in a dark cavern before a gaping pit. Gray mist creatures churned all around me, whispering rags of smoke that I somehow knew were spirits of the dead. I tugged at my clothes, trying to pull me back, but I felt compelled to walk forward to the very edge of the chasm. Looking down made me dizzy. The pit yawned so wide and was so completely black, I knew I must be bottomless, yet I had the feeling that something was trying to rise from the abyss, something huge and evil. The little hero, an amused voice echoed far down into the darkness, too weak, too young, but perhaps you will do. The voice felt ancient, cold and heavy. It wrapped around me like sheets of lead. They have misled you, boy, it said. Barter with me, I will give you what you want. A shimmering image hovered over the void. My mother, frozen at the moment she dissolved in a shower of gold. Her face was distorted with pain, as if a minotaur was still squeezing her neck. Her eyes looked directly at me, pleading, Go! I tried to cry out, but my voice wouldn't work. Cold laughter echoed through the chasm. An invisible force pulled me forward. It would drag me to the pit unless I stood firm. Help me rise, boy. The voice became hungrier. Bring me the bolt. Strike a blow against this treacherous gods. The spirits of the dead whispered around me, No, wake! The image of my mother began to fade. The thing in the pit tightened its unseen grip around me. I realized it wasn't interested in pulling me in. It was using me to pull itself out. Good, it murmured. Good. Wake, the dead whispered. Wake! Someone was shaking me. My eyes opened and it was daylight. Well, Annabeth said, the zombie lives. I was trembling from the dream. I could still feel the grip of the chasm monster around my chest. How long was I asleep? Long enough for me to cook breakfast, Annabeth tossed me a bag of nacho-flavored corn chips from Auntie M's snack bar. And Grover went exploring. Look, he found a friend. My eyes had trouble focusing. Grover was sitting cross-legged on a blanket with something fuzzy in his lap, a dirty, unnaturally pink stuffed animal. No, it wasn't a stuffed animal. It was a pink poodle. The poodle yapped at me suspiciously. Grover said, no, he's not. I blinked. Are you talking to that thing? The poodle growled. This thing, Grover warned, is our ticket west. Be nice to him. You can talk to animals? Grover ignored the question. Percy, meet Gladiola. Gladiola, Percy. And there's a picture of Percy and Gladiola. <laughs> she is pink, isn't she? <laughs> I stared at Annabeth, figuring she'd crack up at this practical joke they were playing on me, but she looked deadly serious. I'm not saying hello to a pink poodle, I said. Forget it. Percy, Annabeth said. I said hello to that poodle. You say hello to that poodle. The poodle growled. I said hello to the poodle. Grover explained that he'd come across Gladiola in the woods, and they'd struck up a conversation. The poodle had run away from a rich local family who'd posted a $200 reward for his return. Gladiola didn't really want to go back to the family, but he was willing to do it if it meant helping Grover. How does Gladiola know about the reward, I asked. He reads the signs, Grover said, duh. Of course, I said, silly me. So we turned in Gladiola, Annabeth explained in her best strategy voice. We get money and we buy tickets to Los Angeles, simple. I thought about my dream, the whispering voices of the dead, the thing in the chasm and my mother's face shimmering as it dissolved into gold and all that might be waiting for us in the West. Not another bus, I said wearily. No, Annabeth agreed. She pointed downhill toward the train tracks. I hadn't been able to see them last night in the dark. There's an Amtrak station a half a mile that way. According to Gladiola, the westbound train leaves at noon. There's the end of that chapter. The next chapter is chapter 13, and it says, I plunge to my death. And there is Percy. Let's see what happens in chapter 13. We have a little bit of time. We spent two days on the Amtrak train, heading west through the hills, over rivers, past amber waves of grain. 
We weren't attacked once, but I didn't relax. I felt that we were traveling around in the display case, being watched from above and maybe from below, and that something was waiting for the right opportunity. I tried to keep a low profile because my name and picture were splattered over front pages of several East Coast newspapers. The Trenton Register News showed a photo taken by a tourist as I got off the Greyhound bus. I had a wild look on my face. My sword was a metallic blur in my hands. It might have been a baseball bat or a lacrosse stick. The picture's, cap picture's caption read, 12-year-old Percy Jackson, wanted for questioning in the Long Island disappearance of his mother two weeks ago, is here, shown fleeing from the bus, where he accosted several elderly female passengers. The bus exploded on the East New Jersey roadside shortly after Jackson fled the scene. Based on eyewitness accounts, police believe the boy may have been traveling with two teenage accomplices. accomplices. His stepfather, Gabe Lugiano, has offered a cash reward for information leading to his capture. Don't worry, Annabeth told me. Mortal police could never find us, but she didn't sound so sure. The rest of the day I spent alternate alternately pacing the length of the train because I had a really hard time sitting still or looking out of the windows. Once I spotted a family of centaurs gap galloping across a wheat field, bows at the ready as they hunted, hunted lunch. The little boy centaur, who was about the size of a second grader on a pony, caught my eye and waved. I looked around the passenger car, but nobody else had noticed. The adult riders all had their faces buried in laptop computers or magazines. And I'm going to show you that picture again and see if you notice that they're centaurs in that picture. Another time toward evening I saw something huge moving through the woods. I could have sworn it was a lion, except that lions don't live wild in America, and this thing was the size of a hummer. Its fur glinted gold in the evening light, and then it leapt through the trees and was gone. Our reward money for a returning Gladiola, Gladiola the Poodle had been enough to purchase tickets as far as Denver. We couldn't get berths in the sleeper car, so we dozed in our seats. My neck got stiff. I tried not to drool in my sleep since Annabeth was sitting right next to me. Grover kept snoring and bleeding and waking me up. Once he shuffled around and his fake foot fell off, Annabeth and I had to stick it back on before any other of the other passengers noticed. So, Annabeth asked me, once we'd gotten Grover's sneaker readjusted, who wants your help? What do you mean? When you were asleep just now, you mumbled, I won't help you. Who were you dreaming about? I was reluctant to say anything. It was the second time I dreamed about the evil voice from the pit, but it bothered me so much I finally told her. Annabeth was quiet for a long time. That doesn't sound like Hades. Hades always appears on a black throne, and he never laughs. He offered my mother a, in trade. Who else could do that? I guess if he meant help me rise from the underworld, if he wants a war with the Olympians, but why ask you to bring him the Master Bolt if he already has it? I shook my head, wishing I knew the answer. I thought about what Grover had told me, that the Furies on the bus seemed to have been looking for something. Where is it? Where? Maybe Grover sensed my emotions. He snorted in his sleep and muttered something about vegetables and turned his head. Annabeth readjusted his cap so that it covered his horns. Percy, you can't barter with Hades. You know that, right? He's deceitful, heartless, and greedy. I don't care if his kindly ones weren't as aggressive this time. This time, I asked, you mean you've run into them before? Her hand crept up to her necklace. She fingered a glazed white bead painted with the image of a pine tree, one of her, end of, one of her clay end of the summer tokens. Let's just say I've got no love for the Lord of the Dead. You can't be tempted to make a deal for your mom. What would you do if it was your dad? That's easy, she said. I'd leave him to rot. You're not serious. Annabeth's gray eyes fixed on me. She wore the same expression she'd worn in the woods at camp at the moment she drew her sword against the hellhound. My dad's resented me since the day I was born, Percy, she said. He never wanted a baby. When he got me, he asked Athena to take me back and raise me in Olympus because he was too busy with his work. She wasn't happy about that. She told him heroes had to be raised by their mortal parent. But how? I mean, I guess you weren't born in a hospital. I appeared on my father's doorstep in a golden cradle carried down from Olympus by Zephyr the West Wind. You'd think my dad would remember that as a miracle, right? Like maybe he'd take some digital photos or something. But he always talked about my arrival as if it were the most inconvenient thing that had ever happened to him. When I was five, he got married and totally forgot about Athena. He got a regular mortal wife and had two regular mortal kids and tried to pretend I didn't exist. I stared out the train window. The lights of a sleeping town were drifting by. I wanted to make Annabeth feel better, but I didn't know how. My mom married a really awful guy, I told her. Grover said she did it to protect me, to hide me in this, the scent of a human family. Maybe that's what your dad was thinking. 
Annabeth kept worrying at her necklace. She was pinching the gold college ring that hung with the beads. It occurred to me that the ring must be her father's. I wondered why she wore it, if she hated him so much. He doesn't care about me, she said. His wife, my stepmom, treated me like a freak. She wouldn't let me play with her children. My dad went along with her. Whenever something dangerous happened, you know, something with the monsters, they would both look at me resentfully like, how dare you put our family at risk? Finally, I took the hint. I wasn't wrong and wanted. I ran away. How old were you? Same age as when I started camp, seven. But you couldn't have gotten all the way to Half-Blood Hill by yourself? No, not alone. Athena watched over me, guided me toward help. I made a couple of unexpected friends who took care of me for a short time anyway. I wanted to ask what happened, but Annabeth seemed lost in sad memories, so I listened to the sound of Grover snoring and gazed out at the train windows as if as the dark fields of Ohio raced by. And we are going to stop there. So we're going to come back and Percy's going to be on the train and we're going to find out what happens next. I didn't say earlier, this book is published by Disney Hyperion. I hope you're enjoying Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief and the Olympians, the Lightning Thief. It's a good book, I think. I really like it. All right. I will see you next time.